The regular meeting of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission Policy and Procedure Subcommittee will now begin. Good evening. Welcome to our regular meeting of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission Policy and Procedure Subcommittee for, the, uh, for September 23rd, 2021. I'm Abigail Sarah, Chair of the Subcommittee, and I'm going to call this meeting for September 23rd, 2021 to order. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by commissioners and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statutes section 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. This meeting will be recorded and posted to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota open meeting law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to please call roll so we can verify a quorum for the meeting. Commissioner Sylvester. Here. Chair Sarah. Here. There are two members present. <laughs> Let the record reflect we have a quorum. Uh, next, we'll proceed to our agenda and minutes from the meeting of August 26, 2021. A copy of the agenda has been posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system which is available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda and accept the minutes from the meeting of August 26, 2021? So moved. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Sylvester. Aye. Aye. Chair Sarah. Aye. Aye. There are two ayes. That motion carries and the agenda is adopted and the minutes from August 26th are accepted. Uh, and now the next item for our meeting is a couple of announcements from the chair. Um, first, the mental health co-responder program will be discussed at the September 30th meeting of the City Council's Public Health and Safety Committee. Um, this is something that was originally brought up and discussed in the PCOC starting back in 2016. So we're very excited to see this program move forward and um, develop. I believe the FAQs will be finalized and available on the city's website by the September 30th meeting for anyone who's interested. Second, um, our November meeting of the subcommittee falls on Thanksgiving Day. So our November meeting will be canceled. We are having a two hour meeting uh, in October from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Third, there are positions open on the PCOC currently and for next year. So I believe there are four positions open uh, in total. We really hope that people from the community will apply and join us in our work. Those are all of my announcements. The next order of business on our agenda is a presentation by Professor Rachel Moran from St. Thomas Law School. We are so very excited to have her here a second time. Thank you very much, Professor Moran. Uh, welcome and please take it away. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about disorderly conduct today. I'll keep it quite brief since um, I know Commissioner Sarah, you provided some reading for folks to review. Um, my, you know, my area of research and scholarship is police oversight and accountability. I uh, appreciate the chance to speak to a few of you a couple months ago on that topic. Um, and disorderly conduct is really very related, in my opinion. Um, before I went into academia, I was a public defender and a criminal defense attorney for seven years in Chicago. And now part of my job at St. Thomas involves teaching a criminal defense clinic where we I do work with students on real cases, uh, people charged with crimes. And so I've been thinking for pretty much my whole practice career about ways to reduce potentially harmful contact between police and civilians, which includes making fewer arrests and pursuing fewer charges for minor crimes. So that's where the thought process about disorderly conduct came into play. Um, in some ways, disorderly conduct is a lot like other misdemeanor crimes that the commission might be thinking about. Um, there are a lot of misdemeanor offenses and misdemeanor prosecutions that I think are really worth re-examining. A lot of cities are doing that. I know uh, the commission had the opportunity to read some information about Boston's district attorney and how she has uh, declined to prosecute many misdemeanor offenses with really excellent results. 
A lot of states are, of course, decriminalizing minor drug uh, crimes. Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis, excuse me, itself chose to abolish laws like lurking and spitting and minor uh, ordinance crimes like that a few years ago. Um, and so in some ways, disorderly conduct is deserving of rethinking for very similar reasons. It criminalizes minor behavior. It creates criminal records that cause more harm than perhaps uh, the prosecution of them could create any good. They serve as barriers to employment, to housing, things like that. Um, but there's also a little piece of disorderly conduct that I think actually sets it apart from even other misdemeanor crimes that may be rethought. And that is just the incredibly broad language of disorderly conduct statutes and ordinances, including Minneapolis's. Um, what that broad language does is enable police to stop and arrest for nearly any annoying, socially annoying behavior. Um, and I'm not going to display the Minneapolis disorderly conduct ordinance on the screen, but uh, it's it's quite a mouthful. Some of you may have read it, um, but it it criminalizes. It says no person in any public or private place. So in other words, essentially anywhere um, can engage in and I won't read the whole text, but any conduct which disturbs the peace and quiet of another. Well, that's really, really broad. And now the actual text is much longer and a little bit harder to read, but that's how broad it is, is that it um, criminalizes any conduct which disturbs the peace and quiet of another. Um, I think we may be able to recognize by now that some people's conduct is more likely to be criminalized than others and that some folks are more vulnerable to having someone else say that their conduct is disturbing or annoying or bothering their peace. Um, I have a little uh, a proposition that some people would find controversial, but I think that um, in order to avoid the harmful costs of criminalization and the costs of police civilian contact. Sometimes we need to let ourselves be a little uncomfortable or to let ourselves have our peace disturbed at times. Um, and I don't say that lightly. I do live in uh, work, live and work very near downtown Minneapolis and um, it has struggled over the past year and a half or so. Um, there certainly are times where there are some people who are just hanging out downtown and it seems like um, their behavior is not the most welcoming or inviting to guests in the city or things like that. Um, so I don't mean to put any of this lightly. I don't mean to say it's an, just a, the most uh, the simplest conversation. But the reality is the approach of just criminalizing people who are disturbing our peace or who are annoying us is not a remedy. The criminal system is reactive in nature, um, taking someone into arresting them or giving uh, taking them to jail for a brief period of time is not going to solve the reason they may have been behaving disruptively in the first place. It doesn't um, do anything other than remove someone from our presence for a short period of time. It doesn't solve the problem. And so um, the reason I came to this position of advocating for getting rid of disorderly conduct laws is in part because we need to force ourselves to think proactively about social problems rather than uh, reactively to the people that frustrate us. And um, the last thing I'll say is beyond uh, just the idea that the criminal system can create barriers that aren't worth it, barriers to um, people li living productive lives, I think we also have to acknowledge that interactions with the police, the more we create space for the police to be interacting with civilians, the more opportunity we create for those interactions to be harmful. And I don't mean to say by any means that all police civilian interactions are harmful or problematic, but I also don't think I need to recount here some of the tragedies we've experienced in Minnesota recently involving police responding to very minor offenses and uh, ending up in tragic losses of life. So we do have a social obligation, I would say, to think critically about what we ask our police to do 
and how we expose people to potential police force. Um, I think I'll end there, but I'm happy to answer any questions at all. Thank you, Professor Moran. But, uh, that was a really excellent presentation, and um, I, I really appreciate your remarks. And uh, your academic paper has also been published as part of this agenda. Um, I know Commissioner Sylvester and I have read it, so, <laughs> so we're going to probably have some thought provoking conversation here. Um, I will open the floor and invite public comments from the community. Um, with that, are there any community members on the line who wish to address the commission? If so, please press star six to unmute yourself. If anyone from the community would like to address any remarks or questions to Professor Moran, please just press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, hearing no public comment, um, I will direct the clerk. Well, there isn't anything to receive and file. Um, I will open this up to um, any discussion from Commissioner Sylvester and myself. Uh, Commissioner Sylvester, did you any have any questions or remarks for Professor Moran? Yeah, I. First of all, as I watch my toddler chase the cat around, I mean, he's disturbing the peace, right? Like he's disturbing, like that's what a toddler does, right? And so if we think about, you know, fundamentally criminalizing that type of behavior in a broad social scale, that it's kind of ridiculous. Second of all, as a paramedic, I over the last number of years have been put in positions where as a deeply Scandinavian person, right? Like my, my people don't raise their voice except for a single reason, right? But that's not the same with all cultures. And so early on in my career, I noticed myself interpreting people raising their voices in conversation in the way that my Scandinavian family members would interpret that, right, as a threat, as anger, whatever. And I'm wondering culturally if there's some sort of a, um, a disconnect between some of our folks in public safety and some of the folks that they're interacting with, that they're interpreting raised voices, certain behaviors, whatever, as a threat or as a disturbance when really they're not. Um, that's just something that I kind of noticed about myself that I've had to work on and really kind of understand culturally. Um, and lastly, I think there's no police officer that I work with in Minneapolis that probably wants to be, that comes to work every day, super excited about, you know, finding folks in like the disorderly realm. You know what I mean? Like, especially in our current staffing model, nobody comes to work saying, boy, oh boy, I can't wait to go down to Nicollet Mall and just like round up everybody I can. You know what I mean? Um, so not only do I think um, addressing some of these issues would help the community, but it would also help um, a lot of our officers kind of focus their attention. Yeah, thanks. I mean, those are just such good comments. I I won't really say much in response other than I agree with all your points. Um, I, uh, you know, when I moved to Chicago at age 22, I found myself realizing some of those same lessons. Like the reality is people different cultures interact in very different ways. And I think when we see terrible anecdotes from around the country or in our own cities about the reasons people call the police or get the police called on them for really truly innocuous behavior, a lot of it is a cultural unawareness, often by white people, um, that is just making assumptions about people based on something that's simply different than what they're used to. Um, and that's, so that's, I think a lot like disorderly conduct gives room for that to happen and for really unfortunate consequences as a result. And then that last piece, I agree, like this is not what law enforcement wants to be doing either. And um, when we think about how we allocate police budgets, which of course is a major topic uh, in Minneapolis right now, and I won't weigh in on that other than to say, a lot of people are um, realizing that we we spend our police budgets in the wrong places or on the wrong things. And part of that is because we expect police to do so much more than perhaps they're actually well equipped to do or what they even want to be doing. 
And so part of um, the conversation around budgeting, whether you're a proponent of shrinking the budget or simply doing other things with it, is how do we use uh, law enforcement budgets wisely? And I don't think it is asking police to respond to the person on the corner who's just frustrating some folks nearby. Thank you for those remarks. And uh, I would like to offer a few observations and one question for the professor. Um, one, one observation I have is that uh, we do have quite a bit of data also attached to this, <laughs> to this meeting. And there is um, a racially disproportionate arrest and citation rate as well as prosecution rate. Um, so that kind of bears out your point of certain groups are targeted or certain groups are found to be uh, disturbing the peace in a way that other racial groups are not. Um, and that's sort of feeding into some of the racial disparities that we're trying to address as a city. Um, so just offering that as part of our data. Um, and my question, oh, and I wanted to make another observation is I was also a public defender uh, in Hennepin County and most of my cases were out of Minneapolis, most of them out of downtown Minneapolis. Um, and one difficulty with disorderly conduct is that anything disturbing or kind of bothering people, particularly on like Nicolette Mall or a really busy area, um, it, how can I say it over captures true mental illness? It sort of over captures people who can't control their behavior or can't control it in the way we want them to. And so I think you get a large number of truly mentally ill people being brought into the criminal justice system when that's not what anyone wants to see happen. You know, no one wants to see that happen. Everyone wants the person to get treatment or medication or housing or, you know, like whatever the thing is that's needed. So just offering that as uh, in addition to race, I think there's also like the mental illness or cognitive disability aspect um, in, in disparities. And then my question for the professor uh, is when I was a public defender, um, I had a certain number of disorderly conduct cases that were charged as part of something else. So it'd be like disorderly conduct and trespass or disorderly conduct and assault or something like that. And what the prosecutor would offer and sometimes my clients would want to do is to plead guilty to disorderly conduct and dismiss the other misdemeanor, dismiss the trespass or assault. Um, and so when I was, you know, had to advise my client on kind of like what that meant for them, certain misdemeanors are what's called enhanceable. And I'm sure you know this professor, you know, just speaking for the group here. Um, so even though there are misdemeanor, like misdemeanor trespass or misdemeanor assault, if you have more than, you know, more than one or two in a certain time period, they can be enhanced to gross misdemeanor, or in the case of domestic assault, even up to felony. So there's an advantage to pleading guilty to um, a lesser crime or a non-enhanceable misdemeanor, such as disorderly conduct. So I don't even know what percentage. I would not say a majority, but I would say there is you know, there was like this noticeable number of cases where having the option to plead guilty to disorderly conduct versus something else felt like a benefit. Um, I'm of two minds about that. You know, perhaps it was a benefit. Um, perhaps if we had gone to trial, they would have lost or something like that. But also sometimes I felt that, well, if you really didn't do the enhanceable thing, you know, if you really didn't do the trespass or the assault or what have you, then, then why are we here? Because really your conduct wasn't criminal. Um, so I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about that or anything you'd like to share on that piece. Sure, thank you. Um, let me first just make one, uh, one quick suggestion if um, you haven't already read this person or not, but there's a professor at uh, UC Irvine named Jamelia Morgan who writes specifically about disorderly conduct and mental health issues. And she um, is uh, really more of an expert than I am on that specific point and is a great person to um, look into if you're interested. As to the question, so the question about disorderly conduct and how it affects, like are there times when people charged with crimes actually want disorderly conduct to be an available 
um, offense to plead guilty to. I have wrestled with that. I think when I wrote my paper, that was actually probably the hardest topic for me to tackle because I have been a defense attorney for a long time and I hear what you're saying. It's a reality is that sometimes it seems like kind of the better option if you're faced with multiple crime charges and the prosecutor says, I'll dismiss the more serious one if you plead to disorderly conduct. Um, and I have two responses. None of them are going to be perfectly satisfying, but I have two thoughts on the. It's a complicated topic. One is I do think um, I do think I share your concern that just having it as an option um, enables a system where almost everything resolves. Well, many, many things resolve with guilty pleas. Um, people plead guilty for tons of reasons that are not their guilt. And sometimes it's because something like disorderly conduct seems less harmful than the risk they're facing if they go to trial. And so it's really not an issue of did I actually commit disorderly conduct? It's I'm cutting my losses and I'm trying to prevent myself from getting convicted, the possibility of a conviction on a more serious charge. And so I'm just going to accept it regardless of whether it's appropriate. Um, and that's a problem. So I think in some areas when we create a system where it's possible to charge people with many offenses and then just kind of entice them to plead guilty to the lesser offense, that's not actually solutions oriented at all, even though it can be appealing to the individual client facing this risk. So part of me recognizes it can benefit individual clients in certain situations, but also that as a systemic issue, it's still a problem. Uh, but I wrestle with it. The other thing I'll say, though, is it would be possible. It would be unusual, but it's possible to create a system where, for example, disorderly conduct is still an ordinance or still a state statute, but it's not an arrestable or even citable offense. So in other words, if that's the sole reason you are getting arrested or cited, that can't be a reason. So they can't arrest you. They can't even issue a ticket. So it could be uh, uh, the way I would see that happening is it can still be an add on offense if you want. It can still be if you're getting arrested for a more serious offense, you could also be charged with disorderly conduct or the prosecution could later on still offer a plea to disorderly conduct, but it can never be the sole basis for a criminal case to open. Um, I do think that that would obviously, well, for those of us who've ever practiced criminal law, that would be unusual, but I don't think that there's anything prohibiting um, Minneapolis or the state or other uh, communities from writing a provision like that into law. So I just throw that out as kind of a, perhaps a creative workaround to the issue we're discussing. Really appreciate that. Thank you. And I will just offer one more time if anyone from the public would like to ask any questions or make remarks, please press star six. Commissioner Sylvester, are you jumping in line here? Yeah, can I can I ask one more question? I guess thinking about trespass disorderly conduct together. Um, first Moran, have you ever looked into or know of anybody that's ever looked into the connection between people? trespassed off of public transit and number of folks at bus stops, trains, whatever, who uh, who um, patrols those areas um, and has been some pretty Sarah and I um, on some really cool work that we're, we're trying to get done. Um, but these people get trespassed off of the bus or off the train um and many of these people who are homeless kind of live there like on public transit have you run into anything any data any um, research about people who are getting trespassed off of these areas and disorderly conduct i haven't i think anecdotally i can confirm that, that um, i've also seen that kind of thing happen or so public transit is a great one but also um it happens with it happens in a lot of uh, places. I also practiced law in Denver for a few years and people would get trespassed from public parks or or even 
the local Walmart parking lot or whatever it is, and then they would end up getting charged with disorderly conduct for instead being in an area that nobody wanted them because they weren't allowed in the areas that they would frankly live. And so um, I can only speak anecdotally. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of any good studies. I'll think about it, see if I can uh, come up with any, but uh, I do. Uh, your concern is consistent with my lived experience as a lawyer. That's a good call out, Commissioner Sylvester. Thank you. Well, um, thanks to all who made public comment, I guess, to myself and <laughs> Sylvester, and thank you very much, Professor Moran. We really appreciate your continued um, expertise and, and guidance on these topics. It's been incredibly helpful. Um, and we love a good academic study. So thanks for that. <laughs> thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And I will direct the clerk to receive and file this presentation and these comments. OK. Um, the next order of business on our agenda is a discussion of the 10 arbitration decisions that have been overturned since 2005. This item was referred to the Policy and Procedures Subcommittee by the full commission at the July 13 meeting. We have received only five of the 10 requested arbitration decisions from the city attorney's office. I will now open the floor to discussion with my fellow, fellow commissioner. Um, and I will call on myself to make a comment. Uh, I don't know what the holdup is. My understanding is there the, the decisions are with the police the MPD records unit and they're being redacted and that's what's taking so long. However, we, you know, we put in this request. I put in this request in April, so we've been. This has been a long time coming and. Um, last year, Commissioner Sylvester, before you were on the commission, we actually reviewed one arbitration decision as part of our um, those case summaries that we do. And we received the arbitration for that particular case uh, and it was not redacted at all. It was the full arbitration decision and it was part of our public meeting and our public record and so on and so forth. So I don't. I, I don't quite, I'm not really understanding why these decisions are so heavily redacted or what the holdup is. But uh, the fact of the matter is we only have five out of the 10 decisions and I don't feel comfortable having. Like a really lengthy conversation or trying to draw any conclusions from only five out of 10. So I would move or suggest that we move this to uh, a future meeting. And I welcome any comments from Commissioner Sylvester on that. I, I don't have any problem with that. Um, and I guess I'll say some of the ones that I read um, that were on our agenda tonight are partially redacted. Like some have complainants names redacted and some don't, um, which is a little jarring to me. I guess I don't, I'm not really, 100% uh, familiar with what is and is not redacted, um, but there just seemed to be some discrepancy there. Agreed. So um, I'm gonna head. I'm just gonna go ahead and move that agenda item uh, is incomplete and move it to our next our next meeting. Next on our agenda is a discussion of this. Yeah, meeting. I, Did you say something, Commissioner Sylvester? I can't hear you. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, I thought I needed to second that. Yeah. Oh. Um, did, let's say you second that. Uh, let the clerk please call the roll. Is that okay. acceptable? <laughs> Ms. Brock. Commissioner, Commissioner Sylvester. Aye. Chair Sarah. Uh, aye. Thank you. There are two ayes. Okay. That informal motion carries and we'll move it to the next month's agenda. Next on our agenda is a discussion of misdemeanor arrests and citations. I will now open the floor to discussion with my fellow commissioner. Um, and Commissioner Sylvester, I just want to give you one uh, heads up um, that misdemeanor arrest and citation data from MPD that it's like something like eight attachments to this agenda. It is such a huge amount of data. I wasn't able to really analyze it or put together a study or put together any kind of proposal. However, a data scientist from St. Thomas University has volunteered to 
look at it and his you know his profession is data analytics and 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 um, providing reports and that kind of thing and he's going to look at it and provide a report to this subcommittee hopefully uh, at our next meeting so just to give you a heads up on that also i only requested misdemeanor arrests and citations and the data contains felonies and misdemeanors which is partially why it's like so gigantic and kind of unwieldy um, but we've got it so any other I do have a little bit more that I want to discuss, but Commissioner Sylvester, did you, did you have any thoughts or anything you wanted to discuss? I, I don't think there's anything in here that I can really um, digest in its size, so go forward. I just, I wanted, I the, um, the charging data that we received from the city attorney's office, uh, thanks to city attorney Mary Ellen Hang, that's more digestible and it's in these little nuggets so we can kind of look at it more. Um, that really is indicating that there are racial disparities in the nuisance misdemeanors that you and I are looking at and focusing on as part of our work. Um, and I'm trying, what I'm still unsure about, but I think we'll get there is whether this has a um, disparate impact on the homeless population as well as um, various racial groups. So, you know, I, I think this really supports everything we've talked about um, with Professor Moran and even from Professor Natapov when she spoke several months ago that um, these kind of low level nuisance offenses op open up the possibility of negative or unnecessary interactions with the police. Um, and we did, I did include two other academic studies on this agenda. One is the Boston or Suffolk County study, which both Professor Moran and Professor Natapov referenced in their remarks to us. That's a study uh, out of Boston, Suffolk County, uh, wherein the district attorney stopped prosecuting these sort of nuisance misdemeanors or low level misdemeanors that, that we're, we're considering on this subcommittee. And the question was, what happens? You know, does other kind of crime go up? Are these like gateways to more serious offenses? And the answer is a resounding no. Uh, other kinds of crime don't go up. In fact, other kinds of crime go down. Community safety is improved. Um, community relationships are improved because it kind of reduces the number of interactions between police and, and individuals, as Professor Moran was alluding to. Um, so that's out of Boston, not out of Minneapolis, but there is data to support um, a lot of social benefits from reducing prosecution of these kind of misdemeanors that we're looking at. And then the second study, the Cohen housing study, uh, talks about the cost of prosecuting misdemeanors versus the cost of investing in uh, kind of homelessness support services, um, because it's not free, you know, creating uh, social services and housing and medication and like all that, it's not free, it does cost money. Um, but the Cohen study, basic the basic premise is that um, it's a good investment, it's a financially good investment to say nothing of, you know, morals or ethics or just policy. It's a good financial investment. If you put money into um, housing services, uh, mental health treatment, after school programs, family support services, that there is this uh, major twofold return on investment in just, I think, two years or 18 months. Um, so even though there is an initial outlay of money, the city or the county or the state actually financially benefits within a very short amount of time. And, and part of the reason for that is that arrests, citations, prosecutions, and jailing individuals is actually extremely expensive itself. So, you know, housing is not free, social services are not free, but it, it doesn't, it does not cost more than misdemeanor arrests and citations and, and jailing. Um, so those are two points I would just wanted to think about in relation to analyzing this data and considering what kinds of nuisance misdemeanor offenses we as a city might want to, you know, just eliminate totally, like, how the city totally eliminated spitting. Um, you know, perhaps we would want to totally eliminate 
uh, possession of paraphernalia or public urination or something like that. Or if not eliminate totally, decriminalize it and drop it down to a petty misdemeanor. And there would be a lot of social benefits in doing that. Even in these um, really, shall we say, busy parts of the city, like downtown, like Nicollet Avenue, um, like certain other corners of the city, there, even if we reduced prosecution and you know arrest and reduce police, perhaps not police presence, but reduce the number of interactions between police and the public, all of the data available shows that if we invest in other kinds of services, rather than just the straight arrest and citation and going to jail, um, there is a major benefit and it is cost effective in actually the short term. Those are the reasons I forced you to read over 200 pages of academic studies in preparation for this meeting. And let's see. Um, I can either take public comment now or Commissioner Sylvester, did you have any uh, further remarks? Well, for anybody watching us, if the if you want a real world example, I think of this in Minneapolis, we can look at the Catholic Charities buildings at 165 and 173 Glenwood, um, which houses a lot of folks who were previously homeless um, in a very secure um, kind of private apartment like dorm like space or um, what the American Indian Community Development Corporation is running down on uh, Franklin Avenue at Ashinabe Waukegan. Um, which is, again, another model for like previously homeless folks um, having like, like a stable, clean, um, secure living space. Um, and the fact that we're not necessarily changing behaviors in these people, um, we're just giving them dignity, space, security, that sort of thing. Um, and we would deal with these folks under a bridge or we can let these, these folks live their lives in peace and security. And I mean, those are kind of two examples of... of uh, Nonprofits kind of taking on that in our own city. Thank you. Those are two great examples. And uh, I'm sure all first responders, including paramedics, would rather interact with people having a medical emergency in, you know, kind of like a housing space or a more secure location rather than trying to find someone under a bridge and there's a report of person down or, you know, something like that. I'm sure that doesn't lend itself to the best interaction when you're a first responder and trying to provide service. You know, it doesn't, and it also doesn't lend itself to dignity, right? Like that's a key piece that we never really, I think, discuss in these discussions is dignity. You know what I mean? Like living in a tent is not necessarily dignified, right? And um, I think that's a key social component that we need to provide people in these discussions is that sense of dignity. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Sylvester. And with that, are there any public comments? If so, please press star six to unmute yourself. And this is the general public comment period, so you're free to comment on the misdemeanor portion of the discussion or uh, any other remarks you'd like to share with the subcommittee. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Um, hello, this is uh, Dave Bicking. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, comment about the uh, arbitrations. Um, I sent uh, uh, Chair Sarah an email um, shortly after the last uh, Policy and Procedure Committee meeting, um, talked some about the arbitrations in there. I hope uh, um, Commissioner Sylvester also got that forwarded to him. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, it's still uh, quite disturbing that the city is not providing the arbitrations in a timely fashion and that they are so heavily redacted. Um, it turns out that the, I did send one um, uh, sample of an arbitration to you, uh, the case of Blaine Lehner, and um, that turns out to be uh, now on your agenda as the uh, fifth one listed, so uh, new this month. Um, you'll see if you take a look at that on the agenda that um, there's a, a lot of redactions, including all of pages 10 and 11, um, which seem to be uh, quite unnecessary to redact. 
The version I sent you coming from the Bureau of Mediation Services has no redactions and thus is, uh, let's just say it's a heck of a lot easier to understand what's going on and if the general public can receive that from the Bureau of Mediation Services, it seems like the PCOC was a special position in, in uh, you know, police uh, governance and accountability should get uh, no less um, when you, um, you know, request that for your um, information and for your analysis. So um, I find that quite disturbing. They're more redacted. I did offer to uh, get more to you. I've uh, been pressed for time. Um, I will uh, still continue to try to do that. In the meantime, I don't know if you've tried looking at the Bureau of Mediation Services yourself. Um, it has a listing of the arbitrations there. Frankly, their search function I found to be not uh, very user-friendly. So um, I quickly you know, was able to see that some of them are there. Um, others, uh, not so easy to find, but certainly um, the Bureau of Mediation Services seems to be a more fruitful place to find these arbitrations than through the uh, um, services or lack of service from the uh, city attorney and uh, um, clerk's office. So um, I hope you'll do that and maybe we can work together and figure out which ones um, you need to get and which ones we have already available and can provide to you. And hopefully by the next meeting, you'll have enough that you can make a, a much better analysis. Um, in my email, I analyzed a little bit about that Blaine Lehner case and how it was a situation where um, the city uh, terminated uh, Lehner on a use of force that was something that normally wouldn't even get disciplined, let alone be a termination because they did not want to terminate him for the um, use of force that was um, um, the, the use of force that was the subject of the lawsuit. Um, I guess that'd be my comment. And uh, I uh, continue to offer my assistance and I'm sorry I didn't get more to you uh, this month. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bicking. We really appreciate your, your comments and your engagement. And if you have any others to share with me, I would appreciate that. I don't know quite which ones to ask for because all I know is that there have been 10 decisions overturned since 2005. I don't actually have the officer's name or case number or anything like that. So yeah. I'm actually unable to identify which five I'm missing. I just know there's five. <laughs> so that's yeah, it, it, it would be nice if they could at least give you a list of the ones they're working on. Um, that seems a real uh, minimal uh, response to be helpful. So, um, yeah, I'll see what I can find. Um, and thanks for your work on this because I think this is a very important project. And uh, I also want to thank Rachel Moran and, uh, you know, um, you for having her here. That was a very interesting discussion. Um, thank you. Any other public comments? If so, please press star six to unmute yourself. Okay. Well, hearing none and there are no other remarks from the subcommittee members. Going on twice. I will say thanks to all who made public comment. I will direct the clerk to file and receive those comments. And uh, with that, we've concluded the agenda for this meeting. I look forward to our, uh, our, our two hour meeting next month uh, at the end of October. We will be discussing all of these uh, agenda items that have been sort of, you know, kind of like ongoing. Um, and hopefully we will have some data analysis for both arbitration and the misdemeanor arrest and citations. Also, we will be looking at the two potential charter amendments that touch policing. So questions one and questions two on the ballot. I think that will be a really interesting discussion and I hope to have a lot of community engagement and input during that discussion. Seeing no further business to come before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone. Thank you.